Hello. Hey, Mike, can you hear me okay? Not at all. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. So many questions to ask you here. But okay. the bottom line is you got a newish album. You have a tour. That's yep. a lot of stained news to kind of unleash in a one week period that we didn't know was coming. How long did you have to keep this all a secret? Well, I mean, everybody's kind of known about the album thing for a minute. The the tour, you know, listen, the Disturbed tour got canceled, which we were really bummed about. Um, we were definitely, you know, just trying to find something else. And, you know, we heard that, you know, Corn was probably going to be going out and having being a fan since day one, you know, it was, it was really exciting to find out that we were going to be able to go out with them. It kind of brought me back to uh, 1999 when we found out that we were going to be able to tour them on the sick and twisted tour, which we did, you know, 20 years ago. So uh, it was great. So I mean, I've known about that for a little bit. So, and, and, you know, I've been doing some interviews and everybody's like, Oh, you got to do any shows. I'm like, well, I think we're doing some stuff this fall, but so pay attention. So anyways, now it's out. So it's good. Right. I did see that tour that you guys did with corn. That was the first time I saw stained and there was a, a cute little trick that you guys did during the show where I guess to give the corn guys a break, Jonathan would do this rap to basically say, we have the loudest sound system in the world. So we're going to bring out stain to show you that it's the loudest system. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that, that was, was a, in retrospect, it's actually a really smart thing because it gave everyone a breather. It reminded everyone that Stained is awesome, that Stained is not just the opening act per se. But it's funny to see that 20 years later, you're co-headliners. You're going to bring as many people as corn, if not more, one oh, could say. I, 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 I wouldn't go that far. But I mean, <laughs> listen, I just, uh, that was super cool of them for sure. And uh, it was always a really fun part of the evening for us to be able to go up there and do that. And uh you know, that's what they always said. They said, you know, suppose we have the loudest PA, we want to go hear it. So, you know, they let us go up there and play a corn song. And, uh, you know, we told them that how we used to do, you know, when Stain started in Springfield, Mass, back in the, you know, mid 90s, if you wanted to play on a Friday night to people, you had to play covers, you know, so yeah. we learned some of this, you know, the stuff that we really liked and corn was one of those bands. And, uh, you know, real influential for me too. I mean, as far as like, you know, the tuning down i mean that's when i first started you know playing with a, a low b string you know uh and you know really kind of adapted that as you know part of our sound as well and that's really where it kind of came from was you know those guys that is actually something i did want to ask you about with the tuning down i know you're a disciple of eddie van halen and tony mm -hmm. iomi eddie van halen did the half step down yeah. tony iomi was i guess was it a half step down but some of the time it was drop d but some he was yeah. all over the place. Yeah, I, th I don't think they tuned down a half step from what I remember from one of the Black Sabbath stuff. It was always, you know, 440. But I mean, just, I mean, killer riffs, though. I mean, like the best riffs, right? I didn't know who that first band to push you towards detuning was. If it was Korn, if it was going to be Eddie Van Halen, well, if it was going to be weirdly Weezer, because Weezer was always a half step down band for the first five years or so. Sure. No, I mean, Van Halen was the first one that I realized in learning that stuff that, you know, you had to tune down a half step, which when you had the Floyd Rose, which you had to have if you were playing Van Halen, right. you know, it would take you a half an hour to tune a guitar down a half step because, I mean, those things were floating and it was just a, a nightmare. But I uh, and and same thing with the drop D. I mean, Van Halen did was, you know, the first thing was, you know, like Unchained and, you know, a lot of those songs were drop D, you know, so that was kind of my first exposure to that, too. Now I know. And I, now that I look at your background, I see the EVH head that you've got there. Yeah, totally. It's what a great head. What a great amp. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it was some of the things that I just use in the studio that I kind of keep at the house. Right. I don't think that somebody who's a diehard fan of Stain would listen to Stain and go, hmm, I think that they are big Van Halen fans. Did you have to kind of hide that influence towards the beginning? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, it's funny when we went back to, uh, when we went back to do this, uh, you know, we just had that uh, pay-per-view thing of Break the Cycle, the 20th year anniversary that we date, we played this past weekend. And everybody was asking, oh, do you have any footage from back then? And, you know, it got me, you know, digging deep into some uh, closets I hadn't been into in a while to find some old VHS tapes of old stain stuff. And, uh, 
you know, I came out with, you know, some of the very, very early gigs that we did with some of the covers and stuff. I mean, I used to solo through the entire song. So, I mean, I, I, but I kind of got away from that. Um, you know, the music did at the time I had kind of gotten, you know, a little bit, you know, tired of it, didn't want to do it anymore. So, you know, I didn't put any solos in our songs. I just really wanted to focus on the, the music, the song and how great Aaron's voice was and the great mm -hmm. melodies that he had, you know, so, um, so I don't think I hit it. I think it was just more of like an evolution for me of, you know, a progression for me of where I wanted to go and how I wanted the music to be, you know, so I feel, I didn't really feel the need that I had to show that part of, you know, what I do. It didn't, you know, I just really wanted to have great songs that people wanted to listen to. Got it. Well, going back to that original corn tour, that was around the peak of mud shovel. And I'm sure when you're putting together your set list back then, it's kind of like, well, everyone wants to hear mud shovel. What else can we do to keep everyone's attention? And then fast forward to 20 years when you've had what, like 15 to 20 charting radio singles at this point in time. Now it must be the opposite of, hey, how do we get the set list together and keep everyone happy? Because if we leave out this and this, we annoy a certain percentage of the audience. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think part of that is right. You, you know, you you kind of know the things that you have to play, you know, that you feel that you, you know, you, you're fortunate. I mean, I feel we're fortunate enough to be able to have that, you know, uh, you know, that issue to deal with. Cause you're you know, right. it just, you know, it just means that people, there's things that, you know, had done well and, you know, and connected with people. So, um, you know, you kind of build around that, you know, and you add in what you think is going to be, you know, something you might not have played in a while or something that you're excited about or, you know, that type of thing. Makes sense to me, at least. <laughs> but it's just such an interesting thing to think that you had so many singles at this point that if you did a 15 song set, theoretically, every song could have been a charting song, which is coming a long way from the days no. of, oh, man, I hope MTV likes our next single. Yeah, because... no, oh, I was just to say, I remember that, uh, you know, we did we toured on Dysfunction for like, you know, a year and a half plus, And yeah, we had 10 songs. You know what I mean? It was like, that's what we had. You know, I think we did, I think we did some covers in there from time to time, but uh, yeah, it was pretty much the same thing, you know, just in a different order back then, you know, so yeah, it's, it's cool to have a little bit more to choose from. Right. Well, aside from this tour happening, nobody really knows what's happening in the future with touring to say the least. Everyone is no. waiting to see what's next. Now, when I was growing up, the the consummate summer tour band, like the band that is just going to tour during the summer and then go away was the Beach Boys. It became kind of a, a punchline, but now you realize maybe they were the smartest people of them all to realize that's all they had to do. In right. the case of Stained, yes, this is a new album, but at the same time, it's it's a live release that you did at Foxwoods. Is the plan to be kind of like a festival slash touring band or is the band totally back? I don't you know. That's a really good question. Listen. I don't think I could ever go back, you know, with where I am today and, you know, leave for a year and a half, you know, with kids and the family and that type of thing. You know, I, I just, uh, I don't, I, mean, I don't want to do it. You know what I mean? I just, uh, right. it's too much. It's too demanding. It's too hard on everybody really, you know? So um, it's a really good question. I think it remains to be seen exactly how that'll play out. Um you know, we have, we have some shows in July. We have the, you know, the summer, this, you know, the summer thing with corn and uh, you know, we're going to work on a record and work on some new music. And, you know, I, I know there's, you know, talk of more shows next year. Um, so, I mean, that kind of remains to be seen. I think it'll be, you know, I don't think it'll prop, you know, with a record, I don't think it'll necessarily just be every, a summer thing. Mm -hmm. I would imagine there'd probably be some other things in there, but you know, listen, Aaron's super busy with, you know, his country career as well, which obviously is going to continue. You know, I have uh Santa Sonia as well, you know, yes. um, which is working on some new music also. And uh, so, you know, I, I think it kind of remains to be seen how everything kind of fits in and, you know, it's kind of a, a learning curve, I think for us as we, as we move forward with where things are. Yet again, you have guided me towards what I was going to ask, because a lot of bands, they go on hiatus and the band goes into hibernation. But for you, you did Newstead, then you had St. Ansonia, uh, which charted really well, which sold really well, which kind of became its own band without flying the all-star flag kind of thing that a lot of other people would have to do. I don't think that people necessarily realize like, hey, that's Mike from Stain's band, which is always a good sign. They liked it 
for the music itself. So you never really slowed down per se. So have you been writing nonstop the whole time, even though Stain was kind of on break for close to a decade? I mean, there's always that. I mean, I always kind of felt like my my job now when I pick up a guitar is, you know, not to work on, you know, how fast I can play, which when I was a kid, that was my goal, you know, uh, but it's more of like, you know, what's the coolest riff I can come up with, you know, and, and, you know, song wise. So there's always, you know, a backlog. If I'm just sitting here playing, I'll, you know, I have pro tools ready to go and if something cool comes up, I'll, you know, throw it down. And, uh, when it comes time to work on music, it's, you know, you kind of go through that and, you know, sort through it and figure out what you think is still cool and what's not, you know? So, um, so yes, that's what I, I kind of feel like, you know, practicing for me is more about trying to come up with something that's, you know, I think is cool that can, you know, ultimately be a song. Well, I can tell I'm speaking to a person with a good sense of humor and reading that ESPN article where you talk about Boston sports, you see the sense of humor. But of course, there's very little sense of humor in Stain's music. I know those are Aaron's lyrics per se, but it's a very serious band. So I'm curious with all that writing, if you ever wrote something and went, that is too happy, I can't put that out. It's good, but I can't put that out. You know, it's funny. There's this one one song. And actually, there was one song on a Stain record that I kind of felt was that that type of song we did have it um it's called all i want i thought it was kind of like this you know almost a pop song type of thing and around the same time i wrote this other song that musically that it was the same type of thing it might have even been happier sounding than that and i've always but it was always like musically it was super catchy to me and I've, I've just never used it anywhere um nobody else is you know i think everybody's had the same feeling whenever they heard it so it's never been used but uh <laughs> I mean, there are a few of those things coming around, you know, um, I get an opportunity sometime to write for other things. And sometimes I'll, I'll use things like that for, you know, something else. If I'm just writing instrumental music for, you know, whatever, a show or a movie or something, if I can, you know. Cool. Well, before I ask my closing set of questions that are quicker, something that I couldn't figure out per se is my opinion, the most underrated state when it comes to musical exports is Massachusetts. And a lot of people say, oh, the Cars and Aerosmith and Jay Giles and all that is Boston. And then you're from the 508 zone, the- 413. Oh, the 413. Keep going west, we're even west of that, yeah. So yeah. one thing I wasn't able to ever figure out was what was the first band that made it from that region of Massachusetts that we would know that kind of made you go, well, if they made it, so can we. I don't know if I ever paid attention or thought of it because of another band came from our area that I could. I think my goal is to just keep working as hard as I could until that happened. I don't think it really mattered to me where we, where I was. Um, it was just keep moving forward and working as hard as you can, um, you know, to, to try and achieve that goal. And listen, we were, we were able to do it, you know, um, yeah. but so what, so was I, uh, you know, all that remains from Springfield kill switch engages from, you know, East Hampton, which is a couple of, you know, a couple of towns over. Um, it's just a lot of, you know, great musicians. And even back in the day, there was just so many great bands that we used to play with from Boston, but you know, it's, I mean, everything just has to be aligned for it to be able to have success in this business, you know, and I think we were just, you know, worked very hard, right place, right time, you know, yeah. followed things through, but I mean, it could have very easily, you know, not, not as hap not as happened as well. It did happen. Pride of Massachusetts all these years later. So keep that up. And my last two questions, first one has almost nothing to do with what we were talking about so far. And that's what's a TV show that you could recommend to somebody who needs a new show to start? Oh, geez. New show to start. You know, I, I, somebody on the radio is talking about that. Is it mayor of East town? Is that what it is on HBO? That's pretty good. That's pretty okay. thing. Yeah. You're the first person to recommend that one. It's, it's usually Queens Gambit, Schitt's Creek. I uh, saw the Queens Gambit was great. I did watch that. That was really good. Schitt's Creek. Was that on your radar? <sighs> No, it wasn't. I don't think I've seen that. That's a comedy, right? That's a comedy with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't seen that. 
Yeah. Highly recommended if you like arrested development and curb your enthusiasm, that kind of awkward sure. humor. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. There you go. And the close up for you, Mike. And this can include as much self promotion as you want. That's any last words for the kids. Oh, I mean, listen, I just always feel very thankful for where we are and still able to do this. And the fact that we even, you know, reached, you know, and achieved what we have. So, and I, you know, very aware that wouldn't have happened without people, you know, listening to what we do and, you know, helping us out along the way. So just always very thankful to them for, you know, helping us get there. Cool. Looking forward to that Jones Beach, New York show this year. But in the meantime, looking forward to everything that's come from staying. Glad to see you're totally back. Yeah, it's, it's good to be back. Thank you. Outro.